history. Well, you know, it? this area is so big for history because Daniel Boone himself was here. Yes. You know. Yeah. It was, uh, there was, uh, Corbin got established right about the time of the Industrial Revolution, you know, and uh, a lot of the, the railroads that came through, the railroads had to build bridges. Mm -hmm. and they had their own design for the bridge uh. called a Howe Truss. But uh, all these uh, railroads that came through is what opened up uh, before vehicles and, and all that. The way you traveled, you got on a train, mm -hmm. you go around the world, you know, around the United States. But, uh, you know, the opening up the railroad, uh, when they opened Middlesboro up and they said they had iron ore there and they brought the railroad through, that's what brought Corbin in. That so. is so good. What are some ways that people can get involved with you or even contact you if they'd like to, you know, maybe donate their time to help out in some of these? Uh, best way probably would be on the Facebook. You could send me a message or uh, uh, by mail, either one. Okay. Uh, What's your mail address? It's uh, P.O. Box 55, Mount Vernon, Kentucky. 40456. 40456, because they you know there might be somebody out there that want to donate some materials or even donate some uh, funds to keep this going because, you know, this is doing so much for the community. It's doing so much for people in general. You know, you, you can't just buy history like this. This no. is history. No, you can. And when they rebuild these covered bridges, uh, at least there's a percentage of the old material that had to go back into it. Oh, yeah. So a lot of the, on the inside are, are all uh, notchings and engravings of people's names and, you know, past sweethearts and things like that. They're oh, all yeah. carved in there. So when we rebuild these covered bridges, you, you, if the timbers were too bad, you would skim the outside off and pasture it back mm -hmm. on the new because they want to preserve every bit of, uh, as much as they can of what was original. Because everything written in that book, in that bridge and that's notched in there, it's, it's, documented history. What type of wood do you think this made out of? Uh, most of them were made out of uh, yellow poplar. Yellow poplar. Yep, and they had a lot of oak blocks in them. And, uh, That's good hard wood, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, back in those days, you had big timber to make them. You got a bridge that's 203 feet long, so you got to have a, a, a piece of wood that long, so it's hard to get one, you know, right. 16 inches that long so uh, they had to have huge trees. Wasn't that uh, how they also built their homes like in log cabin mm -hmm. homes and stuff? Yeah uh, a lot of times they would use a steam operated uh, sawmill mm -hmm. and before then uh, they would dig a hole out make a pit and they take a crosscut saw and they'd sit there and saw one get down in the hole one on top and they'd <laughs> saw the boards off that way. Son they worked back in them days they mean they just didn't have all these fancy equipment as we do today they did it by hand. It was labor intensive <laughs> extremely labor intensive. And they appreciated things more back in in them days in the early 1900s and the 1800s they had a sense of pride that's what this community needs to get back to is a sense of pride yes. and and do Doing things for a community. Yes, they do. Back then, you know, and it's it's not been too many years ago. People got out, they helped each other, they talked to each other, mm -hmm. and that was a big thing. Getting around and just visiting your neighbors, and uh, and in those days, that's it was essential. Right. It wasn't something you know that you really wanted or liked or to do necessarily, but it was essential mm -hmm. that you did it. If you didn't, you know, because everybody depended upon each other. In this area, how many bridges are like this, like within London and Corbin area? The closest one would be in Paris. Paris? Yeah, just outside of Lexington. It's, it's just been rebuilt uh, probably about eight years ago. Mm. And there's one in Frankfurt, and there's one in Washington County. Oh, that's amazing. And uh, the, the majority of the rest of them are in eastern Kentucky up around Ashland. Mm -hmm. So you travel to all these different places and help with these bridges? Yes, we did. Oh, that's, that's something. And, uh, uh, most of the work on these bridges, when you take them apart and you rebuild them, uh, all the work, in spite of all the new tools we had, a lot of it was done with hammers and chisels. Mm -hmm. You know, there just was no other way to, to build the parts because you got wooden parts that were built, uh, you know, kind of like the way we do metal parts today. So yeah. We had lays and things to cut steel with, but you didn't have anything to cut wood with those different uh, things. So we, a lot of it was 
strictly by hand with a hammer and a chisel to rebuild them. And you know, we're getting an excellent history lesson today because most of the men that originally built these bridges, they didn't have metal and steel to work with. It was completely wood. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> they couldn't, uh, they didn't have steel that was, that was hard enough or strong enough to hold until the 1880s. Oh. And by then, uh, you know, after 1880, you started seeing some limited type of metal bridges. Mm -hmm. It wasn't probably around 1900 that actual steel bridges came into place. And then it was a mixture of the two. They'd have steel and uh, the Engineer Street and, uh, and Corbin is a Pratt. Mm -hmm. It's a Pratt truss. And that's a combination of wood and steel, if you noticed on 